After I read, the, I read the book and I was fascinated by it and uh, I'm not surprised that the Venezuelan ambassador showed up because it's such a fascinating eye-opener to Venezuela for people like us who have not been there. Uh, and I was listening to the radio interview you gave and what I found fascinating about the writing process from what you revealed about the writing process is that you write the beginning first and the end and then you fill in the middle. So that mystified me a little. And, uh, so f with this book in, uh, in particular, for example, when you started, when you first set pen to paper or finger to keyboard, did you already have the nine chapters in mind and the nine characters? Because, you know, when I read the book, I, I finished the book without getting the whole novena concept of it. I only uh, discovered, uh, realized it much later. Uh, so, but did you already have that concept even when you started? That, there were going to be nine characters and this was... Not at all. I knew there were going to be nine days. Okay. So, when I start a story, and I know this is very weird because of all my agent and my publishers also tell me this. I wake up, might be in the middle of the night, with a story in my head. I know the beginning and I know the end. And I go to the computer and I write the beginning and the end. Why I do it's not a plan, but that's how I start, and then I take five years to fill in the middle. <laughs> so that's how skin began as well. Uh, yeah, and uh, I like the way you sometimes, you know, you turn the, the plot line almost on a dime. Like I, I just uh, highlighted something from Pete Nine, for example, where, uh, you know, uh, where Lily pulling herself to a standing position opened her arms in welcome. What a lovely surprise. So what are you cooking? asked Luz, smiling as she walks towards her embrace. We are cooking up life, Lily says, patting her belly, just before she slips on a patch of spilled milk and crashes to the floor. You know, I wasn't expecting that. I, I remember when I read that, I was lying in bed and uh, I, I gasped so audibly that our little fellow woke up. <laughs> it was that much of a start. Well, I'll tell you, you know, I mean, for me, literature is like, it's not just about storytelling, but it's about challenging myself. And if you, at the end of this book, I have written some explanatory notes because I realize that it might be a little confusing about why I do certain things that I do in the book, these cliffhangers, for example. And the reason is that I wanted to try to tell a story using the telenovela tradition, or the radio novella, actually, which started in the Cuban cigar factories to keep workers rolling the cigars entertained and interested. So there would, it is the precursor of all the telenovelas and the serials and that we see today in India and everything out there. That serial storytelling, it originated in the Cuban cigar factories. And I wanted to use that technique, make it credible, but use the same technique throughout the book, using that technique, using magical realism, and still carrying some sort of believable story through. If you notice, when you watch these serials and so forth, I mean, they're unbelievable, the things that happen. And they can go on forever. So I wanted that sense that this story also, even though I have to end it at some point, it can go on forever. In fact, the, the Cuban uh, radio novelas were often called enredederas or culebrones. Enredederas are vines. Mm -hmm. So that is why I use the Casiflora edulis as an anchor and signifier throughout the book. It's a vine that keeps moving and growing. Okay, so it works on several levels, this vine. Culebron is a snake. So, you know, it just keeps turning and twisting and so forth. So that is why I use that technique. And I use the, you know, it seems like maybe like, you know, you're just going on and pop, yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah. Part of it is to wake you up because one of the things that I also have to do is, is with each character, I have to make you like that character and not hate it when you move on to the next character. So that is a sort of tightrope that I walk throughout this book, which is, you know, the reader must identify with the character, but not be sorry when they get to the next one yeah. and want, you know, that other one back. So it's all sort of like dancing a dance. And you, you kept the secret of what happened to Irene, a very good secret, right up to the end. But when
when I actually read the end, it kind of, I was not prepared for it. But I, 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 was, I, want to, I would repeat to, to whoever hasn't read the book. But on the other hand, I, it, it kind of, I expected, a diff, perhaps I, I wanted a different end, or I expected that it was going to turn the way I was guessing it would. Yeah, you still need that option. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's left. It's left out there, but I mean, yeah. Is that and when the book ended, it, I, I uh, perhaps in, in the telenovela tradition, I felt, gosh, uh, there, there, there ought to be a little more. <laughs> so there ought to be a sequel to it or something like that. <laughs> As Doctor pointed out, Margaret, uh, you know, you're building a bridge between here and another culture, which is like a world away. It couldn't be further in terms of geography, in terms of culture, in terms of language, everything. You well, know? I wouldn't say that it's so far away in terms of culture. I think yeah. one of the reasons I found Goa so livable as opposed to anywhere else in India, and I have lived you know, in Bombay and other parts of India, but mostly Bombay, is because the culture is not that far away from the Venezuelan Yeah, so my question, at a pan-Indian level, is this bridge, you know, uh, being accepted here because it's so different, so new. Uh, do you find it easy to talk to audiences in India? Are they opening up to your possibilities? Um, well, I find that, I mean, I don't think Indians are so dumb or so close that they're not interested in, in other cultures or other, you know, can't read other literature. You know, I mean, unfortunately, mainstream Indian publishing is quite reluctant to go there, you know, so. Um, quote unquote, they're Indian authors, they like to typecast them and almost force them to write books that have India-centric themes or Indian characters or whatever. It's very difficult to get published here in India if you don't use that formula. And the only person I know who's actually pulled it off is uh, Rana Dasgupta with Sola. You know, where it's set in Bulgaria or something like that and has no single Indian character. So, but no, because Indian uh, readership, they buy, they'll buy Gabriel Garcia Marquez off the shelf, they'll buy anybody else off the shelf, why not? So it's not that they're, you know, completely illiterate as far as the rest of, you know, world literature goes. So it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's just a matter of the Indian publishing houses, you know, making that jump and any other publishing houses as well. It's not just in India. In, in I can't remember whether it was for this book or another book or, that I was working on. My agent sent uh, sent the book or the manuscript to a major publisher in the UK. And that editor's response was, you know, I love this book. I love the work, but we already have a female Indian writer. <laughs> Okay, so, I mean, publishing, I mean, that's what a, a point that I want to make and why I'm supporting what Fred is doing, for example, uh, you know, that publishing has become so corporatized that, you know, this is, in fact, even editing, as far as editing goes, you rarely get an editor that uh, can even afford to pick up your book just because they love it for its literary merit. Um, they will constantly be considering the commercial concerns and they are chosen for the job now uh, depending on their skill to be able to do that. So it's a very, literary fiction is one of the toughest areas to be in and thank God I'm not like financially dependent on like, what I write because first of all it takes me forever to write a book and secondly it's just a tough area. I have been, just been really, really, really lucky I think in that I have somehow or my agent has found publishers who uh, are ready to take a risk with this. Even this one, I mean, there's no book actually about, uh, you know, that fictionalizes Venezuela in this manner by a woman or a man or a Venezuelan, as far as I know, that is this contemporary at this time when Venezuela is popping into the news. And when I started it, since I take that long to write, Venezuela was not a big deal. I mean, Chavez still hadn't stepped onto the UN podium and said, here it smells like sulfur because the devil has stood here, okay? <laughs> but it just happened that this, you know, became, uh, I mean, I was writing about Venezuela when Chavez started assuming a world stage into whether you agree with him or disagree with him, whatever he's doing is capturing the world's attention. 
Could you tell us a little about finding an agent and relating to an agent? Finding an agent is a nightmare. It is such a catch-22. I mean, basically, if you, you have to be, and I'm talking about American agents or UK, you have to be published to get an agent. To get to to get published, you need an agent. So it's a real difficult conundrum. And I, I mean, I just sort of lucked out because I, when I published Skin in India through Penguin India, there were no agents. Okay, I was picked up directly by David Davidar, and um, so I was published. So when I went to the U.S. looking for agents, I already had something to show them. Otherwise, I think it may have taken me like ages to break through that wall that seems to exist.